This episode is sponsored by Linode. Do you need a Linux server for your latest creation? Then check them out. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit per second network connections, Intel E5 processors, and top of the line hardware to run your servers on. It deploys Linux in seconds from a Linode cloud and you can choose your Linux distribution and node location right from the manager. They have locations in Asia, North America, and Europe and a suite set of tools to make it easy to manage it. If the web interface isn't your thing, they also have an API and a command line. They also provide two-factor authentication, IPv6, DNS manager, plumbing, scaling, and everything else you would want. So get the most out of your Linux node by checking them out at linode.com or devchat.tv slash linode. Hello, yep. welcome to React Native Radio, episode 79. This is your host, Nader Dabit. Today on our panel, we have Peter Pykarczyk. Hey, everybody. And today, our special guest is Vic Advani. Welcome to the show, Vic. Hi, thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. So today, our topic is going to be VR and AR with React Native. And we're going to talk about the company that Vic is uh, one of the co-founders of, Viro Media. So that's going to be kind of the general gist of what we're going to be talking about. But before we do get into the topic, uh, Vic, can you give us a quick intro about, I guess, how you got into programming and how you got into the current situation that you're in with uh, Viro Media? Yeah, sure. So uh, quick intro. I got into programming by being interested in developing games back in, back in high school. <laughs> So, you know, I started doing game development after college, uh, worked in the game industry with one of my high school friends also worked with me in the game industry. Did that for a few, two or three years, uh, actually three to four years, and then um, developed a lot of console games. Left to basically to, to start my own company, and we're looking to take video game technology and uh, kind of put it into different industries, and we thought mapping would be a great industry to do that. So. I left the game industry with, uh, and, and found a new company with my brother and two of my high school friends, and it was called Up Next. Uh, moved to New York, did that for five years, uh, created 3D mobile, app, mobile mapping application. That was acquired by Amazon, uh, ended up in Seattle, uh, stayed at Amazon for three years, and we helped build what's known as Amazon Maps today. And then uh, left and, uh, you know, started another company and we saw that AR VR was really kind of picking up and we wanted to do something new and we want to take our expertise in rendering and, and 3D technology and kind of get, get in this space. And then, um, so yeah, here, here I am today uh, at Vero Media. So can you tell us a little bit about the company and um, what is it that you're doing? Like what's maybe the quick elevator pitch to people that are kind of listening? Yeah, so VR Media, uh, our motto is to make AR, VR development simple. Um, and that's basically our, our kind of guiding philosophy. And the primary way we do that right now is we, we built a cross-platform AR, VR solution on top of React Native. So you get all the benefits that you get with React Native, that fast iteration, that live reloading um, with a set of components that make uh, AR and VR development really simple for for normal developers, especially JavaScript developers or React React developers. Okay, cool. So, does this work cross platform or is this uh, like iOS only? Yeah. So right now uh, for VR, we are uh, cross platform on Android, iOS, Cardboard, Google Daydream, and Samsung app, Oculus Gear headsets. For AR, we work for iOS AR with with AR Kit. And Android uh, AR Core is coming out uh, next month. So it is cross-platform. Awesome. So like, um, is it like a write your code, like one time run it anywhere? Or is it more just like you expose a set of APIs and you have to kind of maybe write the application, you know, specifically for one platform as far as AR is concerned, I guess? No. So, so basically, um, it is mostly write, write for one platform and write anywhere. Uh, because we have our own renderer, that's what enables us to do that. We're not wrapping SceneKit or whatever. We're, we roll our own rendering engine. So you just more or less write once and run anywhere. The only differences are maybe on the controller input. There may be some little flags you check if this is, you know, does this have this button? Does this device have this button or that button? But for the most part, it's write once, run anywhere. 
When you say a uh, different rendering engine, are you saying um, replacement to something like 3JS or replacement to like the whole, like it's the same React Native API, but the internals are different? So the we wrote a cross-platform C++ rendering engine that runs on Android and iOS. And that's what makes our API so cohesive. So we're not using, so basically by writing our own rendering engine, we could write our own features close to the hardware and add on to that as our hardware changes really fast. Um, so for instance, instead of having an API that wraps SceneKit and whatever, Android I don't think has anything equivalent to that. Um, but instead of having a set of components that wrap uh, a, a third party uh rendering engine um, or, the, or the platform rendering engine, we have our own that makes it cohesive and easier to use. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, so, like, with this rendering engine, like, what, like, the first thing that comes to mind, like, for me, with the, all this, like, AR and VR stuff is, like, Snapchat's uh, filters. Yes. Uh, if I wanted to, you know, like, build, like, Snapchat filters in React Native, like, would I use your service? Yeah. Um, so basically, like, you know the hot dog man that they have right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could tell, that you could do that within, like, 20 lines of code um, and have it work cross-platform. Um, so you could have these 3D objects placed in, 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 your, in the real world and have it dance or move around or interact with it any way you want. That's so cool. Side note, did you know that Snapchat makes Halloween costumes now and that you can buy the hot dog man on Amazon? No way. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Too late. I'm uh, already booked for this Halloween. They made for next Halloween. What are you going to be for <laughs> Halloween? I'm going to be Optimus Prime with the mask that like shoots lasers out of the eyeballs. It's really, really awesome. Oh, nice. Dude, you should use this and build yourself like a React Native, like Natter, like for your next course, you know, like imagine Optimus Prime pointing your phone at you and like seeing like the lasers come out of the face or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually really excited about playing around with this because um, a lot of the companies that we do training for, at least they're interested in how to do VR and AR with React Native. So definitely um, after this recording, I'm going to spend next week looking at it um, once I learn a little bit more about it. So. Yeah, definitely. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, and we also have an app called Figment, uh, which is built on top of our platform, which kind of shows you the power of what it could do. It's called Figment AR. So um, you can kind of download that and see the capabilities, at least in the on the AR feature set. Oh, yeah, totally. So it's Figment. It's in the App Store. Is it also in the yeah. Play Store? Yeah, it's, in, it's in the App Store. It's not on the Play Store yet because uh, Google has not released Air Core yet to the public. It's in beta. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> but once, once, once Google uh, makes Air Core public, uh, then we will release it. So, what other yeah. platforms do you run, or is it just this is just a React Native like centric company? So um, we're working on things, but right now we're mostly React Native centric company. Um, but we plan to make. You know, the model of the companies make make uh, development simpler. We're, we want to meet developers where they are, right? I think right now in the AR, VR space, to, as a developer, you have to use a heavyweight game engine to do something like this. And we're trying to remove that from the equation because those are built for games, not applications. And we see ourselves as an application engine. So right now, React Native... I feel is the best solution, the best cross-platform solution, because there's not really much out there yet. I mean, there's things like Flutter, which is kind of still an alpha, but it seems like the the best way to reach the most developers, and it's also well supported and has a strong community. Oh, um, yeah, I totally agree. I was going to ask you why you chose uh, React Native, but I think you just answered my question there. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So I guess when did you start the company and um, like what has been your experience so far like working with React Native? Um, I'm just kind of curious like the technology roadblocks and things that you've run into so far. 
Yeah, so so it's been so we've been with uh, started the company about over two years ago. Um, a lot of that was kind of building the the core rendering engine from the ground up. Um, so at first, you know, admittedly, we didn't know much about React Native. We're learning as as we're developing, but uh, we've since got quite familiar with it. And I think some of the technology cha- challenges were, uh, especially in, in AR VR, when you need really close access to the native hardware, for instance, you need something to, you need to be able to react to something 60 frames per second. Doing that through the React Native bridge is sometimes a complication, right? So finding creative ways to go about, you know, giving users a flexible feature set while um, allowing them to still, while keeping performance up was was a challenge. But, um, and sometimes doing things like animations, <laughs> it's always been kind of a, 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 a an issue with React Native, but I think uh, we, we came up with our own animation framework that we think um, enables a lot of flexibility for, for animating in VR and AR. But, a lot of the challenges are just around designing the API correctly, right? And making sure it's, it's it makes sense. It's not too, it, it it's easy to follow. It make it uh, everything's named correctly, um, and it and it also follows React Native conventions. Wow! So you guys have been working on this for two years, and yeah, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, I can't imagine. I mean, you have to be so far ahead of like, um, I don't know, like if someone were just to kind of start working today on a product. I think I think it's it's really interesting to me because I haven't really heard of the company up until maybe a few months ago. So the mm-hmm. fact that you've been all kind of working together on this, you know, quietly, in my opinion, or maybe I just haven't seen, you know, seen the company uh, like it might not be visible to me for some reason. But the fact mm-hmm. that you've been working on for this long and and now um, VR and AR are starting to come as part of the platform, and you're able to kind of use that rendering engine that you've been building all this time. That's really yeah. really interesting. Is that was that your original business like uh, plan? I guess you would say is that something that you you kind of set out to do? You were like, okay, we know this is going to take a while. We're going to just work on this, and then it's you know no matter how long it takes, uh, you know once we get there, we're ready to release. Or is the, did it just kind of happen organically? So at first we we built the the VR feature set because those those headsets existed and they're out, and um, you know the cardboard headsets came out and the the Oculus headsets came out and the Google Daydream came out and we're like, you know, this this industry is really starting, it's 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 nascent, but starting to take off. And there's clearly a need for something like this. Um, and so we had a goal of, you know, supporting, you know, those those three headsets and then releasing to the public. And then um, Apple announced AR Kit, and then we're like, okay, well, released version one, and then I'll now we always would start ourselves an AR VR company. Let's 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 add an AR feature set to our to our platform and release that. Um, so it, it, part of it was like we had a plan, but part of it was kind of as industry is new, we kind of react to it in a way as, as it as it's changing so fast because it's so new. You know, like Google and Apple announced AR Kit and AR Core kind of suddenly in the past six months or so, and you know, new headsets are coming out next year. So new controllers are coming out. So the industry is changing, changing really fast. So we try to stay on top of that. But at the same time, we, we do plan to send them out like three to six months out to see, to, to kind of guide our releases. So I'm taking a look at the documentation right now. And mm-hmm. it seems like you're you're virtually supporting everything, right? Are there things that you're not supporting now, but you plan on releasing soon? Uh, so one of the things is, is uh, like I mentioned before, AR Core for Android. Um, we plan to release that next month. We're adding new, new new components and new features on a regular cadence now. So, for instance, recently we just added physics, lighting, shadows, uh, animations for for what's called for different three D models, um, and we're gonna keep adding more rendering features to kind of become uh, at par with with the game engines out there. And then keep trying to support different use cases that come up from our users as well. So sometimes people from GitHub come and say like, hey, uh, it'd be cool if I could do this. And we're like, oh, you know, we never thought about that. 
let's let's enable that as well. Right. Have you heard of uh, Expo by any chance? Expo.io. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard of Expo. Mm-hmm. I think the you know both. I almost see like a partnership there where they could, uh, you know, like bake in your API into the Expo product. So everybody, you know, who's using Expo, because I know they just incorporated AR kit. Uh, mm-hmm. but like this would be like awesome for people who are just getting started in Re- React Native, right? React Native on its own can be kind of a, a drain sometimes, right? So like simplicity of like building apps and then having this on top of that is like a match made in heaven. Yeah, you know, uh, it's funny because one of our users brought that up recently too. So maybe we should talk to Expo. Um, <laughs> I, I, I met, I don't think, I met Charlie once at a meetup in Seattle. I don't think he remembers me, but um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think I think as, as more of our users, if they ask us for these kind of things, um, you know, we'll, we'll look into that more. Um, we ourselves have our own testbed app, so you could download it similar to Expo's app. It's like you could just kind of enter your URL, and it works over Endrock and Grok, and you could kind of just play with, make kind of iterate really quickly using that. Um, but you know, I think as as is is if our users request that, then I think that's a path. We, you know, we could we could explore some partnership there. Yeah, because I was gonna say what Expo's doing is really cool for the React Native community. So um, I know they're deeply involved in it. So, you know, we'd love to find some way to work together. Um, so I guess I have a question. Um, one, uh, I have two questions, really. So you mm-hmm. mentioned that um, you picked React Native uh, as a platform for mul- uh, you know, a multitude of reasons. Do you think right. that React itself is kind of like an ideal way to write um, applications in general, and in particular, I guess, AR and VR? And also, do you think that the API that you all have built, it sounds like you spent a lot of time kind of thinking about the API. Have you kind of improved upon maybe um, an ex- the existing like ways to kind of create AR and VR, VR out there? Or is it more of like um, JavaScript is such a well-known language, you want to like give JavaScript developers the same power that like some of these other native developers have in that same space? That's an excellent question, actually. So let me answer that in parts. Um, so yes, I think React Native is uh, a great way to build applications. Um, you know, at when we were at Amazon, people were exploring it. We were there, and you know, a lot of us came out being like, "Oh wow, this is this is the way this is the way apps should be built." This, having a declarative style. It just makes you know. It, it just makes things so much easier, right? Declarative language like React Native, and um, in terms of, uh, and also the, the fast iteration, you just can't beat how quickly you can iterate without that compile and load cycle that you go through with the traditional iOS and Android uh, ways of doing things, right? Um, in terms of your second question, do we improve upon? the the way you build ARV apps now versus what's out there. So currently the way people do this, they use something like 3JS or uh, they'll use, let's say, a game engine like Unity or Unreal. With 3JS, that's like, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a it's a jo- full JavaScript engine that's, um, that's a scene graph. So it's more lower level. So you got to do a lot of things at a, at a lower level, like setting up a scene, uh, you know, doing different interactions and manipulating models is, is there's a lot more boilerplate code in your right to do that. Plus, um, it's not, uh, it's, it's a lot of times you use people interact, interact with VGS through WebGL, and WebGL doesn't necessarily support the, the latest in their hardware like OpenGL 3S, uh, 3.0 or uh, other GPU features that are coming out. Um, So you don't get the full features that you would otherwise. But the main value we add is that uh, we basically build a set of components to make it really easy to do complicated things. Like dragging an object in 3D space, you could just set a drag type, you know, drag, drag to world, and you could just 
drag an object around the real world. So versus in a traditional scene graph engine, you've got to write all that kind of code yourself. So we simplify a lot of the comp complicated, uh, I would say, interactions and model loading and uh, asset loading and other other things, memory management, a lot of these, and and basically the ray hit testing, a lot of complicated boilerplate code that you would otherwise have to write yourself. For instance, we have something called like VRT portal, where you could create a portal and you could just have a 360 video, a 360 movie inside the portal and you could go inside it and you could turn around and see the room that you're looking at and you can walk outside the portal inside of it and we wrapped a whole component to do that for you oh that sounds cool so yeah so there's a lot of stuff we did like that um so yeah go ahead i mm know -hmm. oh, yeah go ahead so i guess I'll, uh, i have another question then as someone mm -hmm. that's like not a virtual reality developer or a game developer or a you know or a developer that's kind of worked on these sorts of applications like, what do people need to keep in mind when they step into this space that may kind of throw them off at first, or is it pretty intuitive? Um, yeah, so there, there's a few things. Uh, first is a lot of people need to understand where AR is right now. I think a lot of there's not much education of what what is what could be done and what cannot be done in both AR and VR, right? So, for instance, in VR, there's a lot of headsets like Daydream, iOS, Android Cardboard, and um, Samsung Oculus Gear that are not six degrees of freedom. In other words, you kind of sit and stationary in one place and you point at things in 3D space, but you can't kind of rotate your head around an object or, or walk and move in, in, in the world, right? You can only do that with the high-end headsets. Um, and with AR... There's right now it's kind of limited to, to placing objects in the world and doing plane finding. You could do things around that, but as, as the technology improves, there'll be there'll be more feature sets added to AR Kit and AR Core. But kind of understanding what you're working with and what is kind of the main challenge I think for developers right now. So I think that's that's the main kind of. Uh, just understanding the limitations of the platforms is, is the main challenge. Um, but also, that also enables you to be really creative and kind of do pretty pretty amazing things if you if you know what you're doing. So when it comes to this planning stuff, and I'm not very experienced in the AR VR world. So like, let's say I want to like, I'm in my, you know, like I pull out my phone, I'm in my bedroom, you know, and like, there's a few balloons, like, you know, like floating around my dresser. And then I leave and go to my living room and have a few balloons floating, you know, floating around in my living room. Mm. Uh, are the limitations uh, like the hardware of the phone? Like, you know, like it can't store like that entire like data set of, you know, like this is where the balloons should float. Let's render them here, you know, and then let's like you know, get the balloons in the living room ready too, right? Or is it the software that's kind of like behind right now? So it's, uh, it's a good question. It's, it's a mix of both. The main, so part of it's like, what you're talking about is persistent AR. Like I'm in one room and I go kind of pretty far and I'm in another room and I drop objects in those two separate rooms, right? And I want to go back between the rooms and see my stuff in the in that room where I left it at. That's correct, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of persistent in AR. And right now there's limitation on um mainly the idea of knowing while the phone could track you pretty well up to like let's say 30 to 50 meters before it, it starts getting a little bit lost, I'd say. Um you know persistent in AR involves kind of like you have to, you need to anchor yourself in the room and then and when you come back in the room you need some you could a lot of people you know you could use gps and location but it's not necessarily accurate enough but you have to combine that with let's say like photo matching or like a marker and have something relative to that marker to 
to persist objects throughout different areas. So that involves kind of some server work and and working with the with what what's currently exists in the in the AR frameworks right now. Gotcha. So you wouldn't be able to like so like this is like you know like imagine like a virtualized like React Native risk list, right? Like you're only rendering what the mm-hmm. screen sees, but it sounds like things are a little different um like in like the AR and VR space, right? Like you it doesn't work that same way. Yeah, so so basically AR works what's called that there's something called the visual idometry system, which is what AR kit and AR core is built on top of. And that essentially tracks you in two ways. It tracks you um, using your gyroscope and accelerometer, and it tracks you using the single-purpose camera. And then it it, weigh, it has a weight between those two values and somehow, through some algorithmic magic, figures out where you are relative to where you started. Um, and it could do that pretty well for a certain amount of meters. VR, based on the headsets, uh, so, so the cardboard headsets and the gear headsets, the Samsung gear headsets and the Daydream headsets, uh, you could you could interact with the world around you, but you can't walk in the world. Um, but the, the higher end VR headsets, you can because they have tracking that you either install in your room or Microsoft's coming out with what's called inside out tracking headsets, which is, you could actually you plug in your headset to the PC and it could track you just from the headset itself using sensors in the headset itself. Um, so it could, tr- it could, so depending on the hardware you're using, it, it, you could track to, to a certain amount, but you have to be really, you really have to be, know what, what hardware you want your application to ship on and what requirements you're looking for. Because the industry is pretty fragmented right now, it's important to know what your target is. Gotcha. That totally makes sense. So it's mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a complex problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in terms of like the normalization, um, do you think that uh, like these platforms will continue to kind of go their own ways, or do you think you know like I know you're you're solving that, you know, like, mm-hmm. um, do you think that, like, um, the goal will be to support, like, everything and just kind of how we can use React to build, like, web and native stuff? Or are there things that you're like, well, you know, like, we do, we only do, like, this type of AR, you know? No, we plan to support, um, like I said, as, as, the, as the industry changes, we plan to change with it. Um, and I think there'll be, as people expand with new input types and new control types, some will win, some will lose. But um, eventually there'll be standards that will, that will start coalescing across AR and VR, right? And um, I think we're just going to, sounds sounds funny, but kind of be, be proactive and reactive, right? Like, you know, so something comes down the pipeline, we'll be like, okay, well, this this looks interesting and, you know, we should support it. And um, at the same time, try to get ahead of it as well, right? You're definitely ahead of it. <laughs> Two years ago, <laughs> man, I wasn't even thinking about uh, AR at all. <laughs> right. I know, much less on React Native. I mean, that's pretty bold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. We're seeing a lot of interesting applications being created. Like we have a, on our platform, we have a... Um, a studio down in LA called Chaos Labs. And they created a 360 interactive film um, that they've done some screenings for. They submitted to Sundance, so it's it's pretty interesting. We you know we created Figment on AR to kind of just prove out the platform, and we're seeing other people sign up and create new interesting apps too. So it's a uh, it's been an interesting journey to see how you know, what people are creating and what they're starting to do with the platform. So I have a question, like, what if someone wants to get, get started uh, using this? What are the best resources for them right now? Yeah, so right now we have, like, a 
A quick start guide, if you go to docs.veramedia.com uh, slash docs slash quick start, uh, you'll see a quick start guide that will take 10 minutes to walk through. You just um, read that, you download our testbed app, um, set up a React Native project, and you get a hello world scene. You can start playing and getting started with it pretty quickly. And our docs are pretty comprehensive, so you could just read those. Also, we have uh, uh, our GitHub uh, repo with a lot of sampler projects at github.com Vero Media slash Vero. So we have like a bunch of samples there, in AR and VR, to show you how to get started and get familiar with the platform and the different components. Um, and uh, what about pricing and things like that? Like mm -hmm. now and then down the road, like how does that all work? Or is it free? So right now it's, uh, and it will be uh, free. So the core platform will be free to use and distribute your apps with. Um, and down the road, we plan to offer auxiliary services that we plan to charge for. But uh, the core <clears throat> components and the, the, the core platform that, you see today will always be free. All right. Well, with that, I think it might be a good time to get to the picks. Uh, Peter, do you have any picks? Yes, I have two. So if you use Expo and have ever wanted to kind of control uh, your deployment environments, I built this tool called uh, EXP Deploy CLI. Um, I haven't like announced it besides Twitter, you know, and the Expo team retweeted it. But anyway, what it does is it, it'll make copies of your EXP configurations and let you add uh, your environment variables. So that way you can deploy, you know, to staging, to production, and soon like to whatever environment you'd like. So um, think of like A-B testing, uh, you know, like for whatever reason, you could you can deploy as many versions as you'd like. Um, some of the features that I've been thinking about lately are like rollbacks and releases. A lot of the times in a fast moving environment like the one I'm in right now, we make a lot of different changes to both the client and the server. And it's easy to forget like, you know, like over the weekend, like, oh, crap, I totally forgot that I've deployed this and that, right? Like, <laughs> like I've been thinking about how nice it would be to have the option to list a bunch of releases, right? So we'll like automatically get tag, you know, whatever you're releasing. And then the option to roll back too, you know, if like if you kind of screwed something up and you're like, crap, it's just easier to roll back than it is to try to fix it. It gives you that option. We use this at Orchard AI and that's the segue to my next pick. So shameless plug, the <laughs> product that I've been working on for, you know, like half a year or so now, uh, we're sort of getting ready to uh, release. So it'll be like a open closed beta, right? So we're going to slowly, you know, open the floodgates a little bit and uh, see what people think. Uh, if you're interested in beta testing an early product and you love uh, networking or you have trouble juggling like an enormous network and you wish you were better at it, check out orchard.ai uh, and sign up for our beta. Cool. Very cool things going on. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Vic, do you have any picks? Yes, yeah, so I mentioned before, uh, you know, to get a capability of our platform, there's Figment AR. You could download that app and check it out. It's all built entirely in React Native um, using Vero. Uh, also, our quick start guide is uh, veromedia.com docs slash quick start. And um, more importantly, we have a repo of samples called github.com slash veromedia.vero. Uh, you know, you could watch that and just get an idea of how everything works. To learn more about AR, there's this blog by uh, Super Ventures. Um, and this kind of gives you a good idea of where, what AR kit is and essentially what AR core is and what they offer and what that will enable. Um, you know, I firmly believe that AR is going to be uh, enable the next transformation of computing and it will start on, on the mobile devices and go from there. So it's exciting times. Totally. And you're enabling this development for, you know, millions of developers that may not have had an opportunity to get in that. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. So, uh, you know, it's interesting to see what people build. 
So I have a couple of picks. My first is a book. I finally finished my last book after about a month and a half. Um, and now I'm on a new book called So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. I've been wanting to read this for a while. I'm only about a week into it, but um, so far I'm really, really enjoying it. And I would go ahead and say it's good enough for me to recommend. Um, it's basically about, the, I guess, the general gist of it, kind of like what it's known for is um, debunking the follow your passion, you know, cliche. There's a little more to it than that. It actually doesn't just say don't. It's not like it's telling you to go find a job that you hate. It's not about that at all. Um, I would totally recommend reading it. Um, so far, I've already gotten a lot out of it. My other pick is uh, React Native Training. We are doing a few more workshops. We just wrapped up New York. We have uh, announced tickets for Denver, San Francisco, and also New York for 2018. So I think uh, at this point, there still are a few early bird tickets available. Uh, we sold out in New York um, within about a month before we kind of um, launched uh, of the actual training day. So if you're looking to get tickets, I would go ahead and try to jump on those kind of early. Also, I want to mention, because I haven't mentioned this in a few uh, weeks, maybe months, uh, we do do on-site training for uh, companies. We've worked with uh, companies like Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Visa. We've worked with a lot of startups as well as Fortune 500 companies. So we come in and we do like two to three days. Um, so if your company is looking to kind of get jump started in a very short amount of time with React Native, uh, go to reactnative.training and check us out. All right. Well, uh, that wraps up episode 79 of React Native Radio. Uh, Vic, thank you for coming on the show. It was uh, really great. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you in the next week. Bye-bye.